Yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, a paver slave for me. <clears throat> ah, London, there you are. So good that you managed to join in this session. Hopefully this new system will make our video production much simpler. So I have prepared uh, the new video and even though I have to say it myself, it is so well polished that I consider it release ready. But as always, your input is of course highly valued, even if I feel that it's more of a formality in this case. I see. I don't expect there to be any problems, but uh, should you for some reason have any comments, you should be able to stop the video at any time. Uh, using this new system, I think we should be able to quickly go through videos and address any problems in a simple manner. Video production should skyrocket. Without a doubt. Great! So, if you are ready, let's get started. Perhaps there are some minor details that I missed. So I eagerly await your feedback. Very well. Oh, here we are. Welcome to uh, the Caribbean. And uh, more specifically, welcome to the captain's cabin. There I am here with uh, Leia and Oliver. You can see Camilla Po is um, too busy elsewhere to join us. Anyway. Uh, welcome to the Captain's Cabin and the first episode of um, the Captain's Cabin. Where I, the Captain, while being in the Captain's Cabin, uh, will uh, opine on matters uh, not necessarily related to cabins, of which I, as a Captain, am knowledgeable of, for the benefit of those that are not. Not very modest now. See. Well, he's a captain. What can you do? I'll give you that. So, while it uh, feels like it was several months ago, it was actually just a couple of days ago that uh, we had a reading in the local tavern of um, the first part of uh, Treasure Island by author Robert Louis Stevenson. A classic tale. Well, um, that is, they are to be classic tale of adventure, pirates, and the search for buried treasure. I don't even know where to start here. An attempt at some kind of false wall breaking meta humor. Is anyone here going to want to try to understand this? You don't think it's brilliant? It's hilarious! The Treasure Island video was released more than half a year ago, but in game only a few days have passed. And in game, the book hasn't even been written, so he struggles to describe it as something belonging to the past. Hilarious. Well, as long as you're having your fun, I guess. You'll have to excuse me for being too modest to laugh out loud. Oh, that's okay. We are professionals, after all. A thrilling tale, and I had the privilege of being able to share the start with, with my officers like Oliver here, and um, Leah, and uh, some of the local patrons of the Phillipsburg Tavern. An enjoyable evening was undoubtedly had by all, but um, some of the more subtle aspects of the narrative might have gone unnoticed by listeners that are not as knowledgeable about the subject matter as I. So, for their benefit, I will provide the context necessary to allow also the less insightful listeners to fully appreciate and enjoy the story. You can see Leah here, she looks a little bit confused, so um, I'm sure she will appreciate the extra context that I will be able to provide. How charitable. <clears throat> yes. Of course. In case there is any confusion, I am naturally not an expert on pirate B 
because I am one, I intend to become one, have been one, have had family members or friends that have been pirates or anything similar. <laughs> uh, uh, just take a look at uh, this. Um, let's see now. Um, here, merchant license. Um, these documents were issued by the head of the West India Trading Company. They indicate that you are an honorable merchant and do not have to pay commission when selling trinkets. It also shows your crew that you are not engaged in any sort of piracy. So there you have it in. Um, not in black and white, but uh, at least um, in writing that uh, I am not a pirate. Well, that was certainly suspicious. What was this? Some kind of attempt at foreshadowing? I certainly have no idea what you are talking about. He convinced me. Not a pirate. Says so in the document. Mm. So. That uh, crucial detail, detail out of the way. Um, I say, uh, let's get going. Let's go at it. Here, this was the initial part of the story, and starts with the arrival of an unusual visitor to the Quiet Inn. That will start a series of events that will lead the young hero on a grand adventure far beyond the small cove where he has spent his whole life. Far beyond the cove where he has spent his whole life? You assume simple, uneducated people live their whole lives never travelling so far from the place they live that they no longer can see their own home? Well, do they? Well, admittedly, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, it is not entirely unthinkable now, is it? He's the son of an innkeeper. Not difficult to imagine him going to a nearby town to pick up supplies or do some other errand. I'll give you that. But the opening works so much better if we assume he could have lived a simple life in that cove. Never travelling much. The contrast between the simple life he could have led if the guests had chosen another inn and the great adventure he actually goes on, with the difference being entirely due to chance or fate. The contrast makes us question if we are in control of our own lives, makes us wonder about the meaning of life. You're overselling it. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Just a moment. How is this? Um. Here we have uh, the start of the story with the arrival of an unusual visitor to a quiet inn that will start a series of events that will send the young hero on a grand adventure. Well, it's less bad, perhaps. Great, so we'll go with that. We don't need to read far before we get to our major point of interest. In the year of Grace 17... <clears throat> The book is set in the 1700s, but the text does not specify exactly when in this 100-year period that the events play out. But perhaps there are some hints in the text that can be used to pinpoint the events of the book with more precision. Perhaps there are some hints you don't know? Of course I know! Otherwise there wouldn't be a video! So... Why say perhaps? Isn't it obvious? To create a more inviting narrative in the video, to invite the viewer on a shared journey of discovery rather than simply authoritatively stating my observations. But uh, you will state your observations? Ah, yes, of course, but, but in an inviting way. And you are confident in the correctness of these observations? Well, it's a novel written more than 150 years ago, and set perhaps more than 250 years ago, around 100 years before it was written. Claiming that anything based on what is written in it is factually correct would be a reach. Yes, undoubtedly difficult to know how well researched the novel was, or how correct information the author had available about the time it was set in when he wrote it. Exactly! So that's why you use perhaps as an out, because 
What you are doing is pure speculation. I like to think of it as an educated guess, but yes, you are correct. There is undoubtedly an element of speculation involved. Okay, as long as we are in agreement. You didn't check if the author actually said something about when the book is set? Aha! But that does not matter. The whole point is that we assume the setting in the book is historically correct, and based on that try to determine when it is set. It does not matter what the author might have said, we only look at the book itself. I see. Again, as long as you are having fun, I guess. A little later it is said about the mysterious guest that the male had set him down the morning before at the Royal George. And here we have several bits of valuable information. The mail refers to the mail coaches that transported mail between different parts of Britain. The Royal George was an inn and the stopping point of the mail coach in some towns. In addition to the mail, the coach would also transport passengers. And the mysterious guest had evidently travelled in this manner. To see why this is relevant, we will take a look at the history of mail coaches in Britain. Well, that certainly sounds exciting. Yes, it does, doesn't it? I was certain you'd find it interesting. In 1700s England, the primary means of communication was by post. But roads are bad, and mail was often carried by so-called post boys, lone horse riders. Bad weather, injuries, attempted robberies, the potential threats to mail delivery were many. The result was that mail delivery was unreliable and unpredictable, with mail often being lost or tampered with. Not only was communication with different parts of England bad, it was also underused due to its low quality. One man that observed this sorry state of affairs and saw that it could be improved was John Palmer a theatre manager from Bath. Inheriting the old Orchard Street Theatre in Bath and later becoming the manager of the Theatre Royale in Bristol, he established a coach service to move actors, personnel and props between the two theatres. And in the process, noting that coach services in general were much more efficient than the system that existed for main delivery at the time. For example, if he could travel by coach between Bath and London in a day, why would a letter need three days to cover the same distance? That picture of the donkey, what was that? Ah yes, the donkey post. There actually were some places where donkeys were used. Between Bristol and London? No, 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 that was just for comedic effect. Uh, amusing, don't you think? Haha! <laughs> Mm, uh, it was uh, used in a place that had the steep roads or something, uh, not really related at all. And you still used it? Oh, artistic license and all that, you know. I thought you were a pirate, not an artist. Sure, let's call it practic license. Ah, wouldn't that be a letter of mark? Um, yes, and theoretically I could have used the letter of mark to acquire an artistic license, couldn't I? An artistic license is an abstract concept, not a physical object, freed from the need to slavish the copy, the inconsequential details of objective reality. The artist is better able to communicate fundamental truths on life and the human condition. Ah, so that's the reason. I was certain that it was to give art critics something to do. <sighs> His belief in the idea that mail delivery could be improved was so strong that he sold his theatres and moved to London to lobby the post office to get them to adopt his idea. But in the tradition of bureaucrats everywhere, senior post office staff were not convinced, or they were at least unwilling to entertain the idea that improvements to the services provided by the post office was at all possible. There were, however, others that were more receptive. With the postal system providing significant revenue for the state, the promise of a more efficient and reliable postal service, which would make it easier to raise taxes on postal services, 
Let John Palmer convince William Pitt at the time, counselor of the executor, of the potential of his idea. With the support of William Pitt, John Palmer was allowed to demonstrate the soundness of his idea. William Pitt, obviously careful with the expenditure of public funds, supported the idea, but not as far as to fund the demonstration. So the cost was borne entirely by John Palmer himself. Still, on the 2nd of August 1784, after many delays and active attempts at obstruction by the postal office, a coach left Bristol at 4 pm and arrived in London 16 hours later. Less than half of the 38 hours required with the old system. Mail coaches were shortly after made permanent and the number of routes significantly increased. The new system was far more efficient than what preceded it, and what a magnificent system it was. The well-constructed wooden wagons were pulled by four strong horses, with the driver sitting on top of the coach near the front. Four passengers riding inside, and three extra places for passengers on top of the wagon. The mail coach guard also sat on top of the coach near the back, with the mail stored in a secure box under his seat. Heavily armed with two pistols and a blunderbuss, the guard would keep the mail secure and he carried a horn that would be used to signal the arrival of the coach and when blown would cause other traffic to scurry out of the way of the mail coach, which ideally would avoid stopping whenever possible, even when picking up and delivering post. Travelling at night, the mail coach would thunder along the roads of the country under the watchful eyes of the guard. The guard also carried a watch to keep track of arrival and departure times, and with the watch synchronized to London time, the mail coach not only ensured efficient communication between different parts of England, it also synchronized the time across the land. Some places, two mail coaches traveling in different directions would every night meet at the same time at the same place. Like the regularity of the movement of the sun and moon, the mail coach would impress on the simple countryman that there existed a system that affected faraway events like an invisible force, a foreshadowing of future improvements in communication that would come with later advances in technology. The mail coach formed an efficient communication network that reduced effective distances by quickly disseminating information across the nation. Everything moving to the synchronous time of London forever changing the way people interacted with each other across vast distances. You are getting too carried away again. I assume you are getting close to the point where you will tell how this relates to the book Treasure Island. Well, the strange guest travels with the Royal Mail, and with the first delivery of a mail coach being in 1784, we can assume that the contents of the book occur sometime during... Um, 1784, 1789, perhaps? I feel like by stating that at the beginning, much of the mail coach story could be eliminated. Ah, but how would a modern man comprehend all the sub. 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 subtilities of the story without understanding the role the mail coach played in society? I see. Learning about the taxation strategies of the British government in the 1700s will undoubtedly help me appreciate the stories about treasure and pirates more. Exactly! Anyway, that last painting, what was going on there? Oh, uh, this one? Uh, oh, it's from that time that British mail coach got attacked by a lion. In, in England? Yes, well, you know. If you say so. So, when the book says 17, <coughs> this is likely the late 1700s. Perhaps 1790, 1795. Since the coach system seems well integrated in society at the time of the book, so it has probably existed for some years. And that is what we can use about when the events of the book occur 
from the hints provided in the book itself. Yes, so, well, Oliver, how do you feel? A little bit more enlightened now, perhaps? Yes? No? Um, so, one interesting detail, um, if the story is set in the late uh, 1700s, that means that we, uh, being in um, 1750, are not too far from the events preceding the book. Mm, an interesting idea, don't you think? No? Okay. Well, anyway, um, with that, I think that we will end it here. Uh, there's still more to cover from the first part of the story, so... Um, before continuing the narrative of Treasure Island, um, the next time we will have a closer look at the mysterious visitor to um, to the um, tavern to the um, Admiral uh, Admiral Benbow. So good bye. Goodbye. Lots of reshoots on this one, I see. Well, uh, it's spontaneous, not artificial. Oh. Okay, so now we have spent half a year, and you've gotten through the first paragraph of the book. I suppose you won't get through to my lifetime, then. Oh, I expect us to be able to speed up once we get through the initial part. If you say so. Well, that was it for this time. There are still some details left from the first part, so I expect that we can have at least one more captain's cabin before I continue. I can't wait. Same here. So, thank you for all the valuable feedback. Until next time, bye-bye.